The reality is when you're working, there's only so much you can do to minimize taxes. Now, there are certainly tax strategies, but when you retire early, there are tremendous opportunities, many of which I talk about on my podcast. I am the host of the Early Retirement Podcast, and I'm vice president here at Root. So today we are going to talk about all of these strategies that you can implement so you don't pay a dime more in taxes than you need to. If these strategies resonate with you, paying less in taxes, investing better, and just having a general overview and clear sense of how to optimize your retirement, you're in the right spot. And I invite you to subscribe for more tips. I'm going to get into the specifics of exactly how you can save on taxes, but it's very helpful at first to know why I even talk about this. And here's why. When I first started in my financial career, I was working at Nuveen Investments. Nuveen Investments is the big fancy firm with the lights and the parking and all the good stuff at a Beverly Hills office. And I liked it, but I didn't love it. And I didn't love it because I didn't feel like I was getting to help people one-on-one. I was helping these big institutions make tons of money all tax-free. I said, why is no one helping people on an individual basis at the same level? And I was realizing, well, they were helping pensions and endowments and institutions, but there wasn't anyone helping the people that could actually help create tax-free income. And in my opinion, the niche I focus on, as you guys all know, are people that want to retire early. And here's why. When you retire early, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to pay very little, sometimes even 0% in taxes. And today I'm going to show you how I do just that. So I started the Early Retirement Podcast, and now it's grown significantly thanks to all of you. So thank you. Please let me know if you found me through the Early Retirement Podcast or if you just found me searching on YouTube. Always fun to hear from you guys. And let me know where you, of course, are watching from. It's always fun. Some people Hawaii, some people Maine, New Jersey. I'm here in Los Angeles. I actually can see UCLA from where I am living right now. So always fun to hear from you guys. So let's go with some easy ones, and then we're going to work our way up if that's okay with you guys. Number one is should you take the standard deduction or itemize? And it's fairly simple. If you add up all of your deductions, so healthcare expenses, mortgage interest, and so on, and if all of that adds to a greater number than the standard deduction, then that's what you want to do. But more often than not, the standard deduction is what most people take. So you have an option. Should I take the standard deduction or itemize? And if you're single, here are the numbers right here. If you are single, the standard deduction is $13,850. And if you're married filing jointly, it's $27,700. If you're over 65, add $1,500, okay? Most of you are watching today not over age 65. Maybe you're between 60 and 65 or in your 50s or some of you even in your 40s really want to get a head start on that early retirement in terms of optimizing it. Wonderful. So this is a very simple, easy way to go, how do I save in taxes? And you're already doing this today. But here's how I want you to think about it and why I even gave you this example. The two next things I want to talk about are tax loss harvesting and tax gain harvesting. Tax loss harvesting you might be doing today, but here's why you want to do it if you're not already implementing it. Let's assume you bought Apple stock. Let's assume you bought it for $10,000 and it went down to $5,000. You can go ahead and realize that loss of $5,000. You go, Ari, why would I do that? That's realizing a loss. And it is, but it's a tax benefit. And here's why. You get to use those losses, $5,000. And you could use those against any real estate gains if you sold a home. You can use $3,000 of that $5,000 to just offset ordinary income. You can use those losses in various ways and they carry over. But you don't just realize the loss, and that's where people go wrong, is they realize a loss for tax purposes, but what you want to do is go buy something similar. So let's assume you go, all right, I'm not selling a home in this year. What should I do? Well, if you have a lot of losses, let's say that you bought an ETF, for example, for $10,000 and it went down to $5,000, you can use that $5,000, use that by realizing the loss intentionally, and then buy something very similar to just repurchase $5,000 worth. And really all you did is take a $5,000 loss deduction in a way that can be used for future years so you pay less taxes. Now you only get to write off $3,000 against your ordinary income when you do that, but that can be a really helpful tool that most people overlook. You're essentially harvesting losses for tax benefits. It doesn't mean that you're losing the amount of equity in that certain position. You can say, I'm gonna take the equity, that I normally would have done nothing with. It just would have went down. I would have just held it. You can take a loss, be really intentional about it, and buy something similar with those funds. You can't buy the exact same investment, but something similar. Now, this is not getting to my standard deduction point, and this tax loss harvesting you've probably heard of. Here's what I doubt you've heard of. Tax gain harvesting. No, I didn't say that incorrectly. Not tax loss harvesting, tax gain harvesting. This is where you intentionally sell things that go up to pay very little in taxes. Tax loss harvesting is where you intentionally sell things at a loss so that you can harvest those losses. 
Tax gain harvesting is where you go, I have a position, Apple stock, for example, and you bought it for $10,000. And maybe it's gone up, maybe it's worth $20,000. You might be able to pay 0% in taxes on that $10,000. And I'm gonna guess you love the idea of 0% in taxes. Who doesn't? So let's go through an example. If you're married finally jointly and your taxable income is below $89,250, you can pay 0% in taxes on those gains. So hypothetical here, you retire early, age 55, and your income is very low. In the future, let's say in five years, a pension begins. And let's say there's rental income in the future and social security and all these things, which might not be there in the future, but today. But let's use it super simple for this example. You say, Ari, I'm, re I'm retired early. I loved it. You did a great job. My income is very low, and so I don't have to pay a lot in taxes. I love you. Now, no one's ever said I love you, but people have said, Ari, that's wonderful. And I'll say, hey, don't let me be the good guy this year. Okay, my dopey joke, which a lot of you will hear of, is I'm not going to save you a ton in tax in a single year. We go, all right, I think that's like kind of why I'm paying you. I go, no, you're paying me to save you the most over the next 30 years. So what we're going to do this year is we're going to intentionally pay a little bit in taxes to avoid paying a ton in the future. But we might try to pay 0% in taxes, and that's really what you all want. So here's the example. Let's assume you retire. You're 60 years old or 55, any of these. Let's say 55. You retire early and your income is very low. In fact, it's zero because you're not working anymore. But let's just say in this hypothetical here, there's no income and you have a very healthy stock position. Okay, you bought Apple stock for $10,000 and it grew like crazy to $100,000. That's a $90,000 gain that most people go in your head, I know I'm gonna have to pay some taxes on it and I think it's 15% and for most of you it will be that. Unless you retire early and have this opportunity. You can, in this hypothetical example, say I'm gonna take that $90,000 of gains from 10,000 to 100,000 and I'm gonna see how much I can pay 0% taxes on. And what was the number I told you before? It's right here, once again, 89,250. That's the taxable income magic number here. So if your income is below that, you get to pay 0% taxes. So in this hypothetical here, if you have $0 of income and you have an Apple stock gain from 10,000 that went to 100,000, gain of 90,000, you get to pay 0% on 89,250 of the gains in the other $750, that would get taxed at 15%. So hypothetical, let's assume that you're done working, but your partner's working and they make $40,000 and your taxable income, let's just say is $40,000, okay? $40,000, remember you get to pay 0% up until 89,250. So 89,250 minus 40,000 means that we have $49,250 that we could realize and pay 0% taxes on. Pretty cool. But wait, there's more. I know that kind of sounded like an infomercial, but the reality is here, there's that standard deduction I talked about. So you get to take that as well. So really the standard deduction, we don't want to forget about. So that standard deduction that I talked about, that 27,700, if you're married filing jointly, that essentially gets added on to the 89,250. So you can create a ton of tax-free income. This is a really helpful strategy for a brokerage account with significant gains and you're retiring early where your income will be very low. Now, there's something known as a Roth conversion. And I've got this cauliflower example. A lot of you are going, oh, you got to change the vegetable to Brussels sprouts or carrots or, or stick with cauliflower. I'm in too deep. But the reality is here, here's what it means. I like to give a super basic example to illustrate this. It's the best way to learn. By the way, I went to a, a doctor a few weeks ago and they used all these big fancy words and I told them, hey, that sounded great. In fact, I believed you the way you were saying it but I have no idea what you just said. Okay, so can you explain it to me like I'm five? I literally said that. Now, I wanna do the same here where I don't wanna use big fancy words for the sake of using big fancy words. If you don't understand how I'm going through this, then I'm not communicating that effectively to you. So I tell everyone, I hope if you have a financial advisor that the finances look good and sound good, but if you don't understand the way they're speaking or if it doesn't resonate with you, you either need a new advisor or you need to ask them to explain it in a different way. So here's my cauliflower example. Right now, if your income is very low, you can do the following. You can say, oh my gosh, Ari, this is wonderful. I love having low income. And I love the idea of paying very little, if not no taxes, because I have no income. But what I wanna do is come to you, let's assume you're 55, you retired early, and you know you have a pre-tax balance that's very healthy. So a 401k, let's say $2 million. You're 55, no income today, but you have $2 million in your 401k. That 401k is gonna grow for you, especially if you're invested well, and it might be worth a ton in the future. Let's say it's worth $5 million, and at age 75, you have to start taking what's called required minimum distributions. What that means is at age 75, you might have to start taking distributions 
of $190,000 a year. And that's just depending on you know basic withdrawal rates and some basic math I did in my head, where you might have to start taking out $190,000 a year at that time. Now, the reality is there might be other income sources. Maybe Social Security is turned on. Maybe it's turned on for you and your spouse. So maybe there's two, $300,000 of income that's coming in in the future. And you're going, wait a second, Ari, that's, that might be even more than what I'm paying today. And that's right. And tax brackets are going up. So in the future, if we don't do any planning at all, you may be in the 33%, maybe plus tax bracket. That's just federally in the future. So I like to do the following, to say, what tax bracket are you in right now? You go, Ari, I'm in the 0% tax bracket. I have no income. I retired early. I said, what if we intentionally ate a little bit of cauliflower or paid a little bit in taxes so that right now we filled up the 10% bracket, maybe even the 12% bracket, maybe even the 22% bracket, so in the future, you don't have to pay taxes at the 33% plus. You're taking that arbitrage, that savings, and you're investing it for tax-free growth. Now, you are paying taxes today. So people go, all right, I don't love this. I would pay no taxes without you, and now you're asking me to pay taxes. But I'm asking you to pay a little bit to avoid having to pay a ton in the future. I have a lot of clients that when I do this, and I'll include a graphic right here, that it can add hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And that green color on top is me creating the fake income of doing conversions during the low income years. Now, Social Security in and of itself is not really a tax strategy, but I want you to know how it's taxed because it is important. A maximum of 85% of your Social Security is taxable at the federal level. Most states don't tax Social Security. So here's how I want you to think about it. You can have $3,000 a month, come from an IRA, individual retirement account, or $3,000 a month come from a Social Security. Where would you rather have? It's the same dollar amount, $3,000, but Social Security is taxed less. So it just means we need to think about this a little differently. Now, in reality, you don't just choose one or the other. When you turn on Social Security, it has all these different factors and ways to think about it because it's gonna talk to your income, and if Social Security is turned on, less needs to come from your portfolio. But the reality is, I wanna make sure that you don't look back going, wow, I collected at the wrong time, so I didn't get to implement a lot of these cool tax techniques. You have something called a tax planning window. It's not a literal window, but it actually is in the, the scheme of your life because if you retire early at 60, you have from 60 all the way until Social Security, and you might collect at full retirement age, let's call it 67, and then RMDs start at 73 for a lot of you. So I wanna make sure we're making the most out of these next 10 years to make sure we don't pay a dime more in taxes than we need to. And lastly, this is only going to be applicable to you if, if charitable giving is important. So let me give my final example, and then I'm going to go to charitable giving. I always like to say when it comes to retirement, please do not retire just for the tax benefits. But if you are retiring, please make sure you're taking advantage of the tax benefits. And as crazy as it seems, there are instances where it can make sense to retire early to do a lot of these cool tax planning strategies. So if this has been helpful, please do, of course, share this with a friend so you can retire early with them. But also make sure that if you're interested in optimizing your finances, you're working with an advisor that resonates with you. So feel free to reach out to myself and you can see in the description below how I help people optimize their finances and you can apply to work with me or another advisor here at the firm. Now, I did promise you a charitable giving example, so here you go. Let's pretend you go, Ari, charitable giving is super important to me for my plan. Wonderful. Well, let's assume that right now you want to give $5,000 a year. That's great. But if you're taking the standard deduction, you're really not getting to benefit from it. And here's why. When you take the standard deduction, you are absolutely at a minimum, let's assume married filing jointly, saying government $27,700, I don't want to pay taxes on that first amount of my income. It's almost like paying 0% on the first $27,700. In fact, not almost, it is. What I want you to do is think about it like this. If you're gifting $5,000 every year, but taking the standard deduction, it's nice that you're gifting it, but you're not getting a tax benefit. You'd only get a tax benefit if you're itemizing and gifting, let's just say, in excess of that, in addition to mortgage interest, in addition to healthcare and other expenses. Maybe if all that adds up to 40,000, then you are, in a sense, getting a benefit tax-wise for that gift. But most of you are not. You're taking the standard deduction, maybe you're doing a little bit of giving. But what I want you to do is consider a donor-advised fund. This is where, instead of gifting 5,000 every year, you say, I'm gonna give 5,000 every year the next 10 years. That's important to me. I say, great, let's put $50,000 and let's put it into a donor-advised fund. But don't take it from cash. Let's take it from an appreciated stock position. Let's assume Apple stock went from 10,000 to 50, 40,000 of growth. Let's put all 50 of Apple stock into your donor-advised fund and at that point, here's what you get. You get a $50,000 deduction in that one year. One year, you get a big deduction, and that gets to be a charitable giving fund for you, almost like your own foundation. Now, when you do that, it saves you a ton of taxes because it's a big deduction. 
And now you guessed it. Maybe we can even combine a Roth conversion in the same year with that donor advised fund. So donor advised fund, you take a big deduction, pay a, you get a huge amount of deduction in your taxes, but with your Roth conversion, you create income. So you're trying to offset these two things so that you take a big deduction in a year where you're creating a lot of fake income to do even more effective Roth conversions. Now, my final joke for you, and then I will leave you to go see my other videos here. Some people will say, Ari, show me my Roth conversion in five years from now, seven years and 10 years. And I can give them a general overview, but I'll tell them I can't. And they go, Ari, I'm not happy with you. I think that's why I'm paying you. And I go, I can't, and here's the reason why. If markets go down significantly, guess what we wanna do? We wanna convert even more. Because if we convert more when markets are down, all the growth, you guessed it, it happens tax-free. So if you have Apple stock and it's worth, let's just say $100 a share to make it easy, it's not, but to make it easy, and it goes down to $80 a share, and you move those shares over to a Roth IRA and it grows, you're taking advantage of all that growth completely tax-free forever. So when markets go down, as opposed to just going boo-hoo, let's be a long-term investor, it's let's do that, but let's also see what strategies exist out there to be proactive and pay any more, really, the minimum impossible in taxes. So hopefully this video has been helpful. If so, please do like this video, share this with someone you want to retire early with. And of course you can reach out to me in the description below if you want a custom strategy.